welcome. I'm Sue Scheich Giles at Bexley Public Library. Uh, we're excited to have Mia Lewis of Common Cause Ohio and Camille uh, Wimbish of Ohio Voice. Before we get started, I will cover some quick notes about how this virtual program will work. This program will follow a similar format to our in-person programs with a discussion and a Q&A. Please submit your questions through the Zoom chat function. We encourage you to submit your questions throughout the program and they will be answered at the end. This program is also being recorded and will be accessible on the Bexley Public Library YouTube page. There will be several other programs at the library this week, including another Candidates Night sponsored by the South Bexley Neighborhood Association. It will be this Thursday, October 7th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Also, we're having another fun Friday in the parking lot from 5 to 8 p.m. We will be celebrating National Hispanic Heritage Month. And now a few words about our guest speakers. Mia Lewis is Associate Director of Common Cause Ohio. She joined Common Cause during the push to pass 2018's Anti-Gerrymandering Issue 1, coordinating teams across Ohio to push for the yes vote. Mia comes from an organizing and educational background and is passionate about protecting and expanding the right to vote. Camille Wimbish is the Election Administration Director of Ohio Voice. She organizes statewide election protection efforts and coordinates the Ohio Voter Rights Coalition, which advocates for modern election reforms and improve voter access. Camille also coordinates the Ohio Fair Courts Alliance. Thank you both for coming tonight. And now I will turn the program over to Mia and Camille. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm just gonna share my screen here in one second. Um, yes, it's very good to be here. And um, we hope that others will be able to enjoy this presentation in the future. So um, we want to talk to you tonight about protecting our right to, to our freedom to vote, um, both in Ohio and uh, across the country. We are here as members or leaders of the Ohio Voter Rights Coalition, which is a network of nonpartisan local, state, and national voting advocates dedicated to ensuring that our elections are modern, secure, and accessible to all, um, all Ohioans. And these are some um, logos of some of our, uh, our members, the ACLU, All Voting is Local, um, League of Women Voters, Common Cause, um, and of course, Ohio Voice. So this is a, what we are looking to talk with you about this evening. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history of voting in the United States, um, and give a bit of a national perspective about what happened in 2020 um, and changes that have happened since then. And then we'll talk a little bit about an Ohio perspective, voting and election changes in Ohio. And then we'll touch on what you can do and we hope to answer um, some of your questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Camille. Well, hello everyone. It's great to be here today. As Mia mentioned, I am gonna be taking things through the very first section, which is sort of a history of voting and elections in the United States. So let's hit it. Okay, well, this slide is super tiny for me, but anywho, um, essentially what I wanted to point out about this is when our country was founded, um, you know, back in 1776, the right to vote really started from a, a place of being very limited to white male property owners. And it was gradually extended. The first class of folks who got the, the right to vote extended was to more white men, just those who didn't have property. And it took another, uh, we actually go back one more slide. Yeah, sorry, I, it's, there we go. Okay. There we go. Um, 
So it was, you know, another hundred years or so um, before the 14th and 15th Amendment conferred citizenship and then essentially um, the right to vote um, to, um, to black men, uh, formerly enslaved men. Um, and then it was not until 1920 until the right to vote was extended to women. Essentially, you could not deny folks the ability to vote just because of your sex or gender. Um, but as we know, just having those legal amendments in place in our constitution was not enough to, to actually secure the right to vote for many of these marginalized communities. There were still legal and sort of um, practical barriers, you know, in terms of poll taxes or literacy tests that were in place to make sure these communities did not have their full uh, rights of citizenship and the rights to vote. So we see through the history of our country, you know, essentially, you know, Native Americans were given citizenship, um, but not exactly the full right to vote. It really took until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 before um, the, the federal laws protected um, communities of color from being discriminated against when it comes to voting. So essentially, you know, color, race, ethnicity, um, language origin are no longer basis for denying folks the ability to vote. So that's sort of um, where we are. Next slide. Sorry, it's, ah, it's being slow and then it's jumping around. There we go. Yeah. And then in terms of like some important dates that really stand out for me in terms of Ohio history, you know, folks may remember back in 2004 attempting to vote, you know, election day was just that one day. Um, and many folks were standing in line for hours on end, uh, five hours or longer in many places. Um, and it was really sort of how we earned a black eye in terms of the way we were doing our elections. And it created this really public pressure to actually have more voting options. That's what led us to have no fault absentee voting. So folks no longer needed an excuse. They didn't have to be out of town. They didn't have to be a senior citizen. Um, essentially anyone who wanted to vote early was able to vote early starting in 2006. And it was really important for us to be able to expand that voting access to make sure, you know, essentially we're not pinning all of our hopes on the elections going perfectly on that one day. We're really thinking about folks who may need um, more access. The other note of, of date of note is 2008, um, the election of Barack Obama was really consequential. Um, there was a huge record-breaking turnout. Um, you know, many people were saying, oh, great, we have a black president. There's no longer any racism, um, cynically, uh, not true. Um, turns out um, many of the Republican legislatures that were taking over um, starting in 2010, there's this whole red wave of, of um, GOP wins, they started thinking, well, look, we had this great turnout in 2008. Maybe we've actually gone too far and we've made it too easy to vote. And so legislatures all across the country started looking at ways to sort of take back, claw back some of those voting accessibility measures that they had um, created. 2013, the Supreme Court guts the Voting Rights Act. Um, so that was certainly a devastating moment and something that we're still living with the consequences of that. Next slide. So as you recall, just a few slides ago, I talked about how important the Voting Rights Act was in order to actually confer um, voting rights to um, communities of color and language minorities. The 2013 decision in Shelby versus Holder essentially said, look guys, you've got to update your formula. This, this practice of um, having certain states with histories of discrimination um, get pre-cleared, ask, you know, basically have those voting changes approved by the federal government, that's going to go away because you need to demonstrate that there's an sort of updated formula that you're using to determine whether or not um, these laws are violating the Voting Rights Act. So that was a key provision and uh, that's now been struck down. Essentially that decision gave the green light to states all across the country, many of which were in the South, but as you see, and by this slide, there, there were more states beyond just the South who sort of green lighted these new voting restrictions over the next decade um, as a consequence of no longer having any sort of gatekeepers to determine whether or not 
these laws were discriminating, discriminating against uh, racial minorities. Next slide. Sorry, it just, it's, there we go. Sure. So the Voting Rights Act was really consequential. Uh, 2016 was the first presidential election without the Voting Rights Act. Um, many of the states were you know, definitely in the South that were covered by these um, uh, preclearance provisions, but it essentially meant that 45% of voting age African-Americans were previously covered by the Voting Rights Act, 36% of voting age Latinos, 23%, voting age Asians, 34% of voting age Native Americans, 17% Pacific Islanders. So these are not um, small numbers of uh, underrepresented communities that no longer have those additional protections of, of having the federal government looking out to make sure that these laws were not actually um, being targeted against these communities. Next slide. Okay, so, um, you know, we've saw how um, over the history of our country, more and more people were gradually um, able to join the voting population. And then we saw the beginning of kind of a, a pushback against that, as Camille said, you know, maybe we've gone too far, whatever that means, um, you know, since clearly you know, in a representative democracy, all eligible people should be able to vote. Um, but this was really shown um, in stark relief uh, this past election. So the 2020 election, given the fact that it was um, carried out in the middle of a global pandemic, it was tremendously successful. It actually had a huge turnout. It was the highest turnout since at least 1900. And one of the reasons was that um, there was an expansion in the ways that people were allowed to vote because of the pandemic. So people, some of the states expanded early voting, they expanded vote by mail, um, they had drop boxes, they had all kinds of different measures to make it more e easier and more accessible um, for people to actually be able to access the ballot. Um, and so um, one thing that was really interesting was that you know, during this very, very successful election, um, suddenly the one party, President Trump, kind of turned against vote by mail. Um, and he, you know, started making kind of disparaging comments about it. So in the past, whereas there was no partisan difference between who was accessing um, our early vote or vote by mail, it started to shift um, and it became actually more popular for Democrats to use um, vote by mail um, than Republicans. Interestingly, in Ohio, um, in the rural parts of Ohio, vote by mail is tremendously popular as well as, as early vote. Um, it's something to think about. But so in the 2020 election, Biden voters were nearly twice as likely than as Trump voters to say they voted by mail. That was kind of an interesting factor. And voter turnout was higher in uh, every state. And that was, that was this, you know, uh, made possible in large part by vote by mail. And you can see that that uh, vote by mail went up um, across the country. And voters also used drop boxes um, and they used them more than in the past. And they didn't just use them on election day, they also, um, use them um, at least a week before election day. Um, and that's actually very important. Um, you know, in Ohio, different states process um, early uh, absentee ballots in different ways. But in Ohio, um, they're, they aren't allowed to count um, the ballots on until election day, but they can get them ready to count. So as people drop off their ballots all the way up until election day, um, they're getting those ballots ready to count. Um, so you had this very, very successful election. And one of the reasons it was successful is because there was a greater reliance on these, you know, fairly new um, forms of voting, such as absentee voting, early voting. And yet the response to that, instead of the response being, oh, this is so great, um, the turnout is higher, more people are able to vote, it's the ballot is more accessible, we actually have had the opposite. We've had lots of states um, introducing restrictive measures 
Um, and at this point, 19 states have actually enacted 33 laws that will make it harder for Americans to vote. So it was, you know, some kind of reaction to the fact that there was actually a very, very successful election with high turnout. But interestingly, um, one thing that is kind of fascinating is that as some states have enacted more restrictive voting measures, other states have enacted voting measures which have enabled more voters to have better access to the polls. So we're kind of seeing a divergence in our democracy in terms of um, some states making it easier and some states making it harder to vote. And other states, and Ohio is right in the, at the moment in the middle, um, has, hasn't kind of gone either way or has put forward mixed bills. So just in terms of what does it mean expanding and restricting access? So expanding access would be allowing early vote, allowing same day registration, expanding voting for people with felony convictions or who are on parole or probation, making mail-in voting expansion permanent, et cetera. Um, and what would it mean to have restrictions? Well, eliminating no excuse um, uh, absentee ballots, requiring ballots to be notarized, um, increasing access for poll watchers, expanding poll uh, voter uh, role purges, um, even things like requiring you to send in a, a photocopy of your ID or things like that. There's all kinds of different ways that voting access to the ballot can be limited. And we've also seen um, a new kind of threat um, in Ohio, or not in, excuse me, in uh, after the 2020 election, new kinds of bills coming forward that not only um, make it harder to go to the polls as a voter, but they also threaten our, our election administration. They, um, there are bills that have kind of allowed legislatures to interfere with nonpartisan local election administration. There are bills that have allowed partisan reviews of elections that is in a not a kind of a normal and proper way. And there are bills that actually um, are, you know, are causing um, elections officials to feel threatened or, you know, feel that they're under a microscope or that they are somehow going to be criminally liable for something. And so that is, it has a real chilling effect. Um, you know, here in Ohio, we have you know, a, a bipartisan boards of elections um, that do everything in pairs, one D, one R, and then, um, you know, all kinds of claims and, and things that are kind of uh, making their lives very, very difficult um, and unpleasant and even have the possibility of um, uh, uh, lawsuits, et cetera. So that's a new kind of threat. So I'm handing it back to Camille. All right, well, Mia sort of took us through what was happening on a national landscape and more localized. Um, we can sort of take up where we are in the timeline. So as you call um, legislatures starting in 2010, we're sort of really keyed in on making cuts to early voting. Um, Ohio followed suit in 2011. Um, they were really interested in cutting early voting like slashing it in half. You may have recalled House Bill 194 um, that was a big voter suppression package that they that they pushed through uh, over the public's objections, and it turned out to be wildly unpopular. Um, essentially, a referendum started to um, have citizens to try to take this to the ballot, and um, lawmakers actually got scared and did something totally unprecedented, and they repealed their own law. Um, essentially just a few months later, uh, afraid that they would get beat back at the ballot box in 2012. But they did try it. And 2013, they followed up by um, trying to take up strict photo ID. Um, folks may know that Ohio has a really great robust list of acceptable documents that you would need to, to provide um, for voting, um, including driver's licenses, but it also means utility bills or paychecks, thinking of ways that can be more accessible. This would um, essentially say those other documents would not be ex accepted, only a driver's license would be the one ID that could be um, used to vote. Fortunately, they did drop that um, over objections as well. 
2014, they thought, well, let's try to eliminate same day registration. Um, we did have a period called Golden Week where folks were able to register um, during the last days of the voter registration period and they could start to go to the early voting centers and cast their ballot. Um, it was convenient for folks to be able to do these transactions in one foul swoop, um, but the legislature decided, well, let's do away with that, um, despite no evidence of it really causing any problems. Um, then over this next four or five years, 2015, 2019, Ohio has been um, going about these large scale voter purges for voter inactivity when it means that voters are not showing up the polls and voting frequently. Um, they've been uh, subject to being purged. And then unfortunately we've learned that those purges are not always very accurate. Um, there have been lots of folks who vote regularly or haven't moved. Um, maybe they've signed a petition. There's no reason for them to be taken off the rolls. And then they've learned that they are actually off the rolls. Um, unfortunately for folks, you show up on election day, you go to vote and if they're not on the rolls. There's really nothing that can be done. Um, so there's been litigation around that and uh, hopefully we're going to make some improvements to the purging process um, so that fewer folks are going to be taken off the rolls. Next slide. Um, so currently we have a law in place that says um, there is only one early voting location per county. So even though there may be counties that may say, oh, you know, we have our board of elections um, at the county seat, you know, it's super convenient, but there's also another location where there's folks who are, you know, closer to the geographic center, a heartbeat of the county, it might be more convenient for them to have an, perhaps an additional location. Well, right now they can't do that. You need legislative approval in order to change that rule. And so what it ends up doing is it forces these large crowds of people to come to one location and it may not be really suited to have, you know, parking or, you know, bathroom facilities. It just may not be set up well to accommodate large groups of people. These folks were unfortunately lined up way onto the highway um, last October um, just trying to get to the very first, there's two Saturdays of early voting and they really wanted to get there first thing in the morning so that they could cast their ballot. They were willing to stand in line for hours on end and even risk being hit by traffic. So um, it's definitely a problem that we've got to fix. Next slide. So why do we limit drop boxes? That's a great question. Um, you know, Folks may have heard that um, there's been a lot of changes in, in states like Georgia and Texas and Arizona. Um, Georgia had a law that went into effect, they were calling Jim Crow 2.0. And it essentially have, has drop boxes, it's gonna restrict drop boxes and do some other changes to early voting, which actually brings it down to like where Ohio's level is. Um, you know, we think that everything is like super rosy in Ohio, but there actually are many restrictions in Ohio that aren't helpful to voters. Um, under the new change in Georgia, they would go from 38 drop boxes to just eight. This is the legislation that's just been passed. It's been panned as being too extreme. And remember, they get their eight, we get our one. Next slide. We know from looking at lots of other states who've been doing vote by mail for a longer um, and, and successfully, Places like Seattle, um, you know, in Washington, they have, they're primarily a vote by mail state. In Seattle, you can see these blue dots of drop boxes all over the city, um, being cognizant of, you know, uh, public transportation and where different communities are, um, just making them accessible so that folks aren't having to go long distances to drop their ballots off. Same thing in Metro Atlanta, you can see tons of drop boxes all over. As you know, Atlanta is very large and they've got drop boxes in all the, all the corners of the county. And then this last one, it's kind of hard to see, but it's Michigan. It's our great state up north. And um, they had over 700 drop boxes throughout their state. And even Ann Arbor, which has a population of about 120,000 residents, they managed to have 20 drop boxes. So imagine how many drop boxes um, we could have here in Columbus. That could be super convenient if only uh, the, the laws in our state would allow it. Next slide. So one of the things that we've been saying is that there's many positive improvements that we could be making to our elections. 
to make sure that we continue to encourage everyone to turn out to vote, to continue to encourage us to be a healthy, inclusive democracy. Um, among those, again, having multiple early vote locations in counties that want them, places like Cuyahoga or Franklin County, you know, you know, it can be 30 minutes to go from one side of town to the other side of town. Um, unfortunately, most folks who end up utilizing the early vote centers are people who are vote located really close to that, to the Board of Elections. Um, and so perhaps if there were more drop boxes, more people would utilize them. If there were more early vote centers in places like libraries or um, other community centers, malls, places like that, it would be more convenient and people would be more likely to utilize them. You want to see ABR, Agency Verified Registration. This is a fancy term for saying when folks go to the BMV to update their registration, their, their driver's license, they'd be asked to um, essentially make sure that their uh, voter registration is updated. Um, that would be an automated process. Um, and if folks are new to being registered, they would again have an automated process for ensuring that everyone is asked whether or not they want to be a registered citizen, a registered um, voter. Um, a common sense idea, we need online absentee ballot requests. This day and age, there's no reason to rely on paper um, requests that you have to send in the mail. If you can just go online and say, yeah, send me a ballot, they should be able to do that. Same day registration, um, that's the idea of, again, being able to go, let's say you discover you've been purged or you discover you forgot to update your registration, but you wanna vote, you know, it's like, I'm here, I wanna vote, let me vote. Fill out the paperwork and let it happen. Other ideas, you know, letting folks drop off ballots. If you've turned in your, if you've completed your absentee ballot, why can't you take it to your polling place, your neighborhood polling place and give it to the folks who are already processing ballots safely? Um, again, things like, you know, letting grandchildren or neighbors be able to return ballots. Those are all common sense, simple fixes that could really make a difference. So we have our ideas of what we think would be helpful based on, you know, we monitor the election protection hotline, the hotline where folks call in and, and you know, report problems. Um, you know, we work with, we talk to election officials and hear from them how things are going. And, and unfortunately, they really haven't taken our recommendations. Instead, they propose some things like, let's restrict drop boxes. Remember, we only have one drop box per county, but according to this new legislation that's been proposed, they think that's too much access. Let's restrict it to just 10 days before election day. It doesn't make any sense. It's a terrible idea. It's um, extremely uh, harmful, particularly for communities who you know, rely on have um, you know, a sort of a mistrust of the mail system. You know, the mail system is working slower these days. You know, it gives you an extra sense of public confidence to just know that you can put it in the Dropbox, it got there um, and it's gonna be counted. Another idea in this new legislation is to uh, shorten the deadline to request absentee ballots. Currently absentee ballots have to be requests have to be submitted three days before election day which is agreed, it is a short turnaround. But the solution that's been proposed is to move the deadline 10 days before election day, which is gonna definitely uh, hurt people in terms of people being caught off guard by these changes. You know, lots of folks are gonna uh, wait and wanna submit their absentee ballot request and then perhaps they had a new change of plans. So maybe they're gonna go out of town. Um, maybe they're, they're sick. Um, some reason that they're not able to, to vote on election day, and then those folks may be sort of um, shut out of the voting process because they weren't able to submit an absentee ballot request on time. We're also concerned about our, uh, this proposal that wants to eliminate the Monday before election day. The weekend before election day and the Monday before election day, those are prime days where voters are really ready and uh, interested in voting. So let's not take away that opportunity for folks to be able to get in there and have their ballot heard. Um, so we're, that is a concern. And then they're also looking to um, tighten the absentee ID requirements. So instead of saying, you can write the last four digits of your social security number on your request or give your driver's license number, um, if, if that's what you choose, this is saying, 
if you want to vote by mail, we need your Ohio driver's license. And we know lots of folks like students or seniors, um, you know, communities of color, they're less likely to have valid Ohio IDs. And so this could certainly be a deterrent and, a pre and prevent those folks from being able to vote uh, by mail. So the last bill that I was talking about was 294. That is what is having the most momentum and the most negotiations. It had one proponent hearing, uh, the Secretary of State testified in favor of that bill that I just referred to, House Bill 294. Um, but this is an ongoing process. You know, there's been a lot of interest um, across the country in terms of making things more difficult. And one of the bills that's been introduced is House Bill 387. It's what I kind of think of as a doomsday scenario, which is to really turn our elections on their head and uh, take away all the successful ingredients um, that were in our, in our election. So for one, it would to prohibit voter registration drives. Can you imagine? You know, you probably are used to seeing, you know, folks maybe at the library who are asking folks to register to vote under this provision. That would no longer be allowed. Um, you know, it's a practice that's as, that's as old as time, it seems. Um, strict photo ID might be on the list. It's been in this bill, strict photo ID required to vote. So you need an Ohio driver's license to vote would be under this proposal, not only to vote on election day, but also to vote by mail or to vote early in person. So that means you would have to, let's say you're voting by mail. It's not enough to just write down your Ohio driver's license. You would also have to include a copy, get a photocopy of your driver's license and include that with your ballot. We you know that's gonna be super hard um, for lots of folks. Most people don't have access to printers and, and all of that. So we don't need to create more obstacles. Um, another huge blow would be to end no fault absentee voting. Uh, you may recall I said one of the things that got us in the direction of having absentee voting was the fact that we had long lines, crazy long lines on election day, because we had, we required folks to have an excuse if they wanted to vote early. This would go back to that. This would go back to those long lines of forcing people to have an excuse. And there was really no justification for it. It would cut early voting down to 14 days. And again, as I mentioned, we could see high absentee ballot rejection rates. So lots of ballots being thrown out because of these new technicalities. Now, this is just something that's been proposed. Um, it, right now, we have not had a hearing on it and we hope that it stays at bay, that only, um, only you know, these more positive improvements would sort of catch on. Um, but we did wanna let you know that that is a possibility. And so we have to stay alert and we have to keep the pressure on our lawmakers to make sure that these ideas don't go forward. Thank you. And I realized actually that um, I had skipped a slide earlier, so I'm going to go zooming back um, because I think it's important to say who is harmed by voting restrictions. Um, you know, people say, oh, well, it's not a big deal to have a driver's license, but actually 10 percent of voters don't have driver's li licenses or state IDs. And, um, you know, there are little things, little things like, oh, well, um, you know, you'd have to mail in this, you'd have to mail in that. Well access to printers and postage are, are barriers for a lot of people. Um, you know, the, what Camille was talking about, making a copy of your personal documents and putting them in the mail, that's also very not secure at all. But a lot of these, a lot of these cuts, a lot of these suggestions really target black and brown voters, students, voters with disabilities, low income voters, and actually um, active duty in rural Ohioans and seniors as well. So, you know, folks who have difficulty getting to the polls on election day, who might need a little extra time, who might need, you know, they want their neighbor to bring their absentee ballot, their voted ballot in, but they're not allowed to do that, who, you know, can can make it to the drop box that's nearby, but they can't make it to the one that's farther away. All of the things that make it harder to vote are things that target people who don't have the time or resources or you know, whatever it is to be able to um, 
you know, to, to do that. To, for instance, you know, students who move often, um, if you have an automatic way of updating their address, that they're less likely to not be able to vote. And I think the point that we're making overall is that we have secure and safe elections, and there are plenty of ways to make our elections better without having to make them worse. And that the impulse to restrict voting doesn't come because there have been problems in Ohio's elections. The impulse to restrict voting comes from a national um, political campaign that wants to make it harder to have access to the ballot. The impulse to improve Ohio's elections actually comes from experiences that have happened in Ohio. We had long lines, we made it better by having um, you know, access to uh, no excuse absentee voting, um, you know, other things like that. So there are ways to make our elections better that respond to experiences that we've had as a state and that are supported by our, our elections officials. And a lot of the things that have to do with restricting voting actually are not responses to things that have happened in Ohio. Um, those are coming from national groups. So we are hoping that you will get involved with us and help protect voting rights here in Ohio. Um, we will send this uh, uh, slides to um, the folks at the Bexley Library and they can send them out to you. And you can click on the links that are in the slides and you'll have access to a toolkit where you'll be able to send an email to your legislator, call your legislator, um, have some images that you can tweet or put on Facebook. Um, you can follow the Ohio Voter Rights Coalition on Facebook and get and on Twitter and, you know, we'll be kind of giving you updates about what's happening with um, this bill and others. We always encourage people to write a letter to their editor, to even to, um, uh, and to have a positive, you know, to have a positive outlook. Be talking about what you want to see as improvements um, in um, elections, rather than saying, you know, we don't necessarily even want to focus on trying to refute the false claims that, you know, we need to um, protect, we need to have stronger voter ID. Let's just talk about the good things that we need to have um, in it and improve our elections. We also have a new campaign that um, we're excited about, which is trying to get our business community to stand with us and to stand up for voting rights. And we're calling it democracy is good for business. We do believe that democracy is good for business. Um, and we hope that if you know any folks who own stores or who are business leaders, um, that you will recruit them um, to sign our pro-democracy letter, which basically just says, you know, um, Ohio doesn't need, um, Ohio needs, strong and secure elections, which we have, um, and we need to protect the access to um, those, uh, to the ballot for Ohioans. Um, we are doing um, a training for folks to learn how to go around and talk to businesses and ask them if they want to be listed as part of our Democracy is Good for Business Coalition. And we have these cool um, decals, which is that logo you can see at the bottom there, which they can get to put in their store windows to indicate that they are a business that supports democracy. So we're kind of um, excited by that idea and we hope that you'll join us um, in that. And of course, there are also things going on nationally. Now, the attacks on voting rights are happening all over the country. And a lot of people hope that by strengthening, um, by implementing strong voter protection um, laws at the national level, that we can kind of counteract some of the things that are happening in the states. And so um, you might have heard of um, HR1, which was the For the People Act. Well, it's been kind of rejigged and it's now called the Freedom to Vote Act. And um, that um, is has an, a lot of things in it that um, are very important in terms of campaign finance, um, you know, things about um, ethical behavior of um, people who are running for office. It has things about redistricting. Um, it has things about um, access to the ballot. Um, and then the John Lewis Voting Rights Act is essentially restoring the Voting Rights Act. Um, and that's very, very important as well. That was introduced in the Senate today. So those are both um, 
both pieces of legislation, really, really important pieces of legislation that would happen on a national level that are really important. Um, and we do have a phone bank that supports those voting rights bills where basically you're calling to um, constituents in states such as West Virginia, Arizona, where their senators are um, have not you know, come out in support of these bills yet and encouraging those constituents to call um, their senators and urge them to support the bills. So um, following Common Cause and Common Cause Ohio are great ways to um, you know, stay up to date with what's happening with those bills, those national bills. Um, and you know, they really, passing them um, is really very important for staving off all the, the bad things that are happening with, um, with voting legislation all across the country. It may be that we need to reform the filibuster in order to pass those. And if so, um, then that's what we have to do because they are simply essential. And I think with that, we've kind of come to the end. So um, we are very happy to answer your questions. I think Camille put some um, links in the chat that folks can access. Um, and I guess I will stop screen sharing and just see if anyone has any questions. And I will put one more thing in the chat. <clears throat> this is a little um, opinion piece that I that came out last week in the Dayton Daily News that talks about ways that we think um, elections can be improved. Any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or write in the chat. Well, if there aren't any questions, we hope you've enjoyed <laughs> this program. Um, this is, you know, voting rights are just obviously so incredibly fundamental to our, our democracy, our democratic republic, whichever way you want to describe it. Um, and um, even though our country has, you know, been arcing towards uh, justice and at sometimes, sometimes it heads in the other direction and access to the ballot is, um, is really so fundamental. Um, there's no substitute for um, uh, making sure that all our voices are heard and that we all participate. Camille, any last words? I think you said it all, Mia. I, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that we can make some make some progress. Hopefully, we can get this federal legislation pushed through. Um, if not, it's really going to be on all of us and every state that's under attack to push back. Um, but there's, you know, we have the power and it's up to us. So um, please feel free to reach out to us if you have questions, if you want to get more involved. We're happy to help. Yeah. Oh, it looks like there was a question from Whitney. If those restrictive measures were passed here, where would you go from there and how could it be rolled back? I mean, a lot of folks are saying that. If we don't get, you know, if 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 very very restrictive voting measures are passed successfully in a lot of states, it's going to be really really hard to roll those back by definition because people won't be able to access the ballot in order to roll them back. So that's why the national legislation is so important. Um, you know, in some ways. Um, we can only be protected by the national legislation. And that's true when it comes to redistricting. It's true when it comes to the Voting Rights Act. It's true when it comes to kind of basic, um, even though the states, each state runs its elections separately and differently, and they are allowed to do that, there have to be some national standards so that it, you know, it isn't profoundly much easier to vote in one state than in another, because that's, you know, that's just simply not fair. Um, so, um, you know, it may take heroic efforts on the national level. And if we can't succeed on the national level, we, it's going to take unbelievably heroic efforts 
um, on the, you know, on a state level. I'll say one other thing, some states, not every state, but some states, about half of them have the, um, have the ability um, to take measures directly to the voters um, with a ballot measure. And Ohio is one of those. So conceivably, um, we could try to pass um, a ballot initiative that, uh, you know, to uh, expand voting rights in Ohio. The, the difficulty is that um, you have to get you know, hundreds of thousands of valid signatures. And uh, again, that is a, a very, very tall order, something that's very, very difficult to do. Um, but, you know, I hope we will rise to the, rise to the challenge if that's what we have to do. What are the aspects of the Freedom to Vote Act that you're both most hopeful about? Well, for one, um, you know, restoring the Voting Rights Act, those key provisions, having a, you know, a formula in place. Um, I think when they were talked about this new, this new um, legislation, a lot of states, it wouldn't just be like states that had been previously covered, you know, states in the South, but many states, including Ohio, could could fall under those provisions and protections if there are, um, you know, several pieces of restriction, restrictive legislation that is passed. So that is helpful. Um, having, like Mia said, having a national standard of having, you know, automatic voter registration in every state is going to be so helpful in making sure our voting rolls are more accurate, making sure people aren't kicked off because of, um, you know, uh, improper purging. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of really exciting things in there um, in terms of, um, you know, many states are not as far as along as Ohio are, you know, some states are not, don't even have, you know, I think for COVID, like places like Kentucky and New York, for the very first time, they had early in-person voting, um, you know, without, you didn't have to have an excuse. So many states are coming along, but having some national standards so that what Mia said, it's not like, you know, it's impossible to vote in Mississippi, but it's super easy to vote in Colorado. It shouldn't matter where you are to have access to the ballot. And, and particularly things like um, if you're someone who um, had a previous felony conviction, um, you're fine in Ohio. Um, Ohio is actually a great state on, on that particular front. But in other states, you can't vote for the rest of your life. That doesn't make any sense. That is just completely not, you know, not fair. So having those kinds of basic standards are really important. I also think that some of the um, kind of ethics provisions are also really important. Um, things that have to do with campaign finance, things, um, you know, when we send this out, we can, uh, well, actually there is a link in the slides that has, a, you know, to a page that has a lot of information about what's included in the bill. Um, and um, it's really comprehensive. Redistricting reform, um, you know, as we are seeing right now, um, it is even when you pass good legislation that's supposed to um, prevent uh, gerrymandering, it's difficult to get people to stop gerrymandering. Very, very difficult. Unfortunately, um, you know, even if that bill were to pass today, um, that would only help us in 2031 when the next redistricting is done. Um, but again, um, you know, better, better now rather than never. So... We've answered Whitney's questions <laughs> and we're happy to answer others. We did put our emails um, at the end of the slides. So if you, you know, if, if you're going to, I think they're going to send out the slides to you. If you have additional questions, feel free to contact either of us. Um, and I can even write my email in here right now. Thank you for attending and please tell your friends. I think lots of folks are completely unaware that some of these awful voting ideas are coming to Ohio or are already here and that they will be 
getting some attention and airtime and hearings um, in the next month or so. So we definitely need people to be ready to lend their voices to this and to sound the alarm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming and providing all this important information. You're very welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much. much.